It's no secret that Intel are lagging behind AMD a little bit when it comes to the desktop CPU market right now, but things are about to get really, really interesting. We've now got the full picture of what to expect from Intel's 10th generation desktop CPU lineup. And without them advancing their 14 nanometer manufacturing process to say 10 nanometer or seven nanometer like AMD, they're basically throwing everything they can at these new CPUs to improve performance. That's from adding hyperthreading across almost the entire processor lineup to claiming boost clocks of up to 5.3 gigahertz, as well as an improved thermal design. So today we'll be discussing all of that plus a little bit more. So I think first of all, let's take a quick look at the entire 10th generation processor lineup because there are quite a few big changes here. So Intel's flagship product here is the i9-10900K. It's a 10 core, 20 thread CPU with a single core boost of up to 5.3 gigahertz and an all core of up to 4.9. Pricing there has an RCP of 488 US dollars, but keep in mind that RCP doesn't reflect what the MSRP or shelf price of these products will actually be. So expect the 10900K to be around the $500 mark once it actually hits stores. This makes it a direct competitor to AMD's Ryzen 3900X, which can be had for around 550 at the time of filming, but you do get an extra two cores and four threads there. So we'll wait and see how the benchmarks pan out between those two, but I think it's it's going to be really interesting. So I think the big number that sticks out there is definitely 5.3 gigahertz because 10 cores and 20 threads, that's nothing that impressive compared to what AMD is putting out with the 3900X and 3950X, not to mention those processors came out quite a while ago. So 5.3 gigahertz, that makes it a 300 megahertz uplift from something like a 9900K. And, you know, we're still working within the 14 nanometer process. So it's going to be quite interesting to actually validate that and, you know, what we can expect in terms of overclocking across all cores. Moving down the product stack is where things get really interesting though. The i7s now get their hyper-threading back, whereas Intel had remove this previously with 9th gen to create some product segmentation. But with the 10700K, we get an eight core 16 thread processor with a single core boost of 5.1. And the pricing here will sit right between the Ryzen 3700X and 3800X, making this very competitive on paper. Honestly though, the processor I'm most curious about is the i5-10600K because finally we have hyper threading on the i5s. On paper, this looks like a decent competitor to the Ryzen 5. 3600, although pricing does have the Intel processor a bit more expensive. Also note that memory spec here, it's back down to DDR4-2666 with the i5s and below, whereas the i7 and i9s now have been raised to 2933 by default. Do note though, that's only a consideration for the locked non-K processors on boards other than Z490. Moving down to even the new i3 models, again, we get hyper-threading across all the processors here, which is great. And these will compete directly against that new Ryzen 3 3100 and 3300X, which we will be reviewing very soon. One big mistake here though, in my opinion, is the fact that there isn't any quad core processor here with overclocking enabled. Because when you're claiming that this silicon can hit five gigahertz all core, no problem, I think that's a big missed opportunity. One clear reason that Intel have done this is to sort of encourage consumers to spend a bit more money and get an overclockable i5 or i7 instead. But consumers who are looking at these budget products might even just look in the other direction instead and get a Ryzen CPU. Even if most consumers buying overclockable processors don't even overclock them in the end, especially these sort of budget end uh, CPUs like a Ryzen 3, it is still a nice to have feature to be able to overclock if you want. And I think that definitely plays on the purchasing decision of the consumer. Now, seeing as Intel are still working with the 14 nanometer manufacturing process, pumping more cores and higher clock speeds into the same silicon without improving power efficiency like AMD has can only lead to more power and heat. So to improve the thermal design and attempt to overcome this, again, this is something that we will test. Although this could just be for i7 and i9s, a thinner CPU die and thicker heat spreader has been implemented. We are also working again with the solder thermal interface material between the two, just as with 9th gen, as Intel has absolutely no business using thermal paste at this point with 14 nanometer. Also, Intel have taken a page out of AMD's books here when it comes to selective CPU core boosting. 
all i7 and i9 CPUs will now be able to prioritize the best performing CPU cores for single and dual core workloads. And now one of the drawbacks, Intel's chipset lifecycle, which typically only lasts around two CPU generations. And that means that this time around with 10th gen processors, you will need a new 400 series motherboard. That means a Z490 motherboard if you're interested in overclocking one of those K series CPUs. I do have a couple of those on hand at the moment that I'm looking forward to testing as well as a few more on the way. Also, 10th gen CPUs and the Z490 chipset now support 2.5 gigabit ethernet and Wi-Fi 6 for a nice little update in faster networking. And lastly, there's an update coming to Intel's XTU overclocking and tuning software. Most notably with 10th gen, you will now be able to set a custom voltage and frequency curve. So pretty advanced overclocking, a lot more than what most people will need, but it's great to see that feature now for enthusiasts. So I think this is definitely one of the bigger rebuttals that we've seen from Intel towards AMD ever since the first generation Ryzen CPUs launched. One of the biggest reasons that these are so popular Ryzen 5 CPUs is because they're capitalizing on the fact that the competitor Intel Core i5s do not have two processing threads per core whereas the Ryzen 5 CPUs do. So now that we do have that enabled on the Intel Core i5 lineup, there's finally going to be some really solid competition there. In terms of the high-end SKUs, I think the Ryzen 3950X will undoubtedly still hold the crown when it comes to multi-core performance, but I think the 3900X and 10900K could be a pretty close matchup. Intel's big focus here is clearly on clock speed and that 5.3 gigahertz number, and that's what they're good at. So it'll be interesting to see whether that is attainable across all CPU cores with overclocking, and if so, what amount of power and voltage that would require. There are of course advantages that AMD still holds over Intel, like being able to overclock any of their CPUs on pretty much any affordable motherboard as well, but we'll get into all of that in the full review. Until then, I'd love to hear your thoughts and comments down below. A huge thanks for watching, and I'll see you all in the next one.